Hi friends, I'm Swapna Gajala and I heartily welcome you all to PSSM Global show, Soul Connect. PSSM Global is an initiative to strengthen the roots of Pyramid Spiritual Society's movement worldwide. PSSM's sole mission is to spread Anapanasati meditation, plant-based food, spiritual science and beneficial uses of pyramid energy to one and all. One of the 18 guiding principles of the PSSM emphasizes on listening and sharing meditation experiences to enhance one's spiritual progress. Through this show, we want to connect you all to various spiritual masters across the globe who will share their words of wisdom, their journeys and experiences. I'm very happy and excited to welcome our guest, Mark L. Karen from Canada. Mark is an agent of transformation, passionate about life, inspiring and helping others to live the life they desire. After a life-altering awakening experience in 2007 and an end to a 22-year corporate-type career, he freed himself to devote his life in service of others. He immersed himself in reading, training, and studying with some of the world's best in the areas of personal growth and transformation, relationships, health, spirituality, and leadership. As part of Tony Robbins' event senior leadership team, he spends his time helping others transform their lives. Mark is the producer of Conscious Living Radio, CLR, a weekly radio program now in its 13th year. He interviews authors, thought leaders, doctors, healers, artists, spiritual leaders, musicians, and many more. So let's welcome Mark and hear about his journey. Hearty welcome, Mark, to Soul Connect. Thank you, Swapna. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, today. So Mark, we are very excited and eager to know about your journey. So can you share us about how you came into this path? Wow. Well, if you would have asked me five years ago where I would be today, it certainly wouldn't be here if I was in my head. That's for sure. Um, you know, I was, I was raised as a Catholic, as a Roman Catholic, as, you know, the background of our family and you know, I always felt I was connected to source. I, I felt that there was something there yet through my Roman Catholic experience or going to church every week and things, I never really experienced it. You know, I didn't, you know, they talk about seeing the light and, and that sort of thing. I, I never really experienced, experienced it. I understood it. I felt it, but I had not no experience of it. And, you know, time went on, you know, well, first really was in high school. It was uh, our sociology class and we were studying psychology. And I, I was fascinated uh, by the work of Freud and some of the stuff we were learning about uh, Carl Jung. And the, um, what fascinated me even more was Pavlov and his dogs and the power of conditioning. And I found myself really interested in, in that line of, you know, work or that kind of thought. Then, you know, years, literally decades go by as I was just a young guy, you know, looking to do what I thought I was supposed to do and having a good job and, you know, a relationship and things of that nature. And what I realized was, you know, I wasn't finding any joy or satisfaction in that. And within my corporate career, I was always kind of an entrepreneurial guy. I was always reaching out to you know, find different ways to make money and not be limited to punching a clock Monday to Friday, nine to five kind of a thing. And along that path led me to read really just a lot of great books in terms of entrepreneurship, leadership, business, and really the underlying foundation of that was really personal growth and development. And then I was introduced to, uh, from one of these, these guys I was working with uh, as an independent sales rep, he introduced me to Tony Robbins' work. Now, I'd always seen Tony. He was always on the infomercials for years, and I'd always been fascinated by some of the things he was talking about, but I'd never, you know, took the plunge and bought any of his programs or anything. And this one friend had given me a couple of tapes to listen to. Yes, they were tapes. And <laughs> I... Uh, I started listening to some of the stuff he was sharing and I was just fascinated and you know, I got home one evening and there was the infomercial. So I bought the program and what I loved about what Tony was teaching was just really a practical psychology point of view 
in terms of how we can create change. So, you know, years went by and, and f- after listening and taking in everything I could, not just from Tony, but, you know, guys like Brian Tracy and uh, John Maxwell, Stephen Covey, and that's just to name a few because, you know, there's so many great books. One of my favorites that I always recommend today is uh, Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, which is always, you know, one of those kind of recommended readings uh, when it comes down to entrepreneurship and personal growth. So, you know, long story short, one day I finally decided to actually attend some of Tony's programs. And I was actually, it was 2007, Scottsdale, Arizona, his program called Date with Destiny. And Tony tells a story of the healing of his wife through, really it ended up being some ancient um, Indian meditations and energy practices. And you know, he tells the story and, you know, if you want to hear it, you got to go listen to him. And, and he tells it at Date with Destiny and a few other programs quite well. But she was affected in, in a way from birth that gave her motion sickness and nobody in the world could help her. And Tony's got access to, you know, the best of the best in the world, the NASA doctors. Nobody could help this woman with her motion sickness until they went to India for, you know, seven plus days and something happened and, you know, She was literally cured. She was healed from something that she'd had all her life that nobody was able to help her with. And so Tony started bringing some of these practices back to these environments. And again, 2007, I remember it as if it was yesterday. And it was, you know, it's a short meditation known as a chakra dhyana. It's over 5,000 years old. And we went through this experience and this was the first time this meditation, this is the first time I actually experienced oneness. And ever since then, my life had changed the, this meditation where we kind of went through our chakras, awoken up these energy centers of our bodies. And I literally had an out of body experience that connected me to what I believe is source. And, you know, something shifted in me because life was never the same after that this nervousness this uncomfortability that i used to carry in my guts um literally disappeared it was gone and because before i when i used to get excited i'd get this nervous kind of stressful reaction in, in my body and and to me that was excitement and you know as you would think excitement should feel good it actually didn't and i didn't recognize that until after this the shift happened because all of a sudden I'm doing things that I was super excited to do, yet I had this internal peace and calm without all of this wretchedness kind of that was going on that I used to call excitement. And it just it just opened things up for me where, um, you know, my heart opened, I realized all we need is love and I just had this connection and uh, it just really, you know, sent me on a journey into a love affair with ancient India actually. and that to me was was quite profound um you know i had read the bhagavad gita a few of the other gitas and science of self-realization through Prabhupada's autobiography of a yogi from uh, yogananda and some of these great books that came out uh, in the 1900s that literally formed and shaped the way i think and feel today in in terms of you know yogic practices and meditation and just this this beingness and it, it's just something that you know for me it's you know how do we especially in today's world we've got all this uncertainty you know COVID everywhere people are uncomfortable they don't know what to do they've got more time they may have less money some people are making lemon out of lemonades and some people are struggling and you know, it brings me to a place where I just, you know, I just trust. I have this trust that everything will always work out and I don't kind of freak out anymore about the unknown. I've come to live with, um, you know, a good amount of uncertainty (laughs) that um, has literally allowed me to have peace even in some of the most challenging times. That's a great message, Mark, about... uh how to be always in that positive thinking so that you attract only those circumstances and how to treat this every challenge and situation as just a learning and not just get overwhelmed with it. An mm-hmm. amazing journey, amazing travel. 
uh, amazing books and thank you so much for sharing. Um, it's completely my pleasure because, you know, I think that, you know, if I can help one person in this world have a more calm approach to their life, to the situations in life, um, and then how to respond or handle what's going on, um, you know, then that's just part of me living my life's purpose. Absolutely. absolutely. My uh, any significant experiences you've had in the spiritual path? Well, it's, well, what I find most interesting is when I feel most connected and when I see the most synchronicities in life is when I actually feel the most connected. So it's, it's this interesting thing. So you feel connected and you see synchronicities everywhere. And sometimes I may not feel connected yet. I see all these synchronicities line up and it's like, oh yeah, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And I've found that the more I... Um, you know, force things to be the way that I want them or I think they should be changes the whole dynamic of the, you know, that experience really, because I find, you know, there's, the, there's this fine line between creating your own reality and making what you want to happen um, and then accepting what is happening. Right. Because, you know, have you ever been in a situation where you thought you really wanted something? You worked your butt off. You worked hard. You worked long hours. You did all sorts of things just to accept and achieve what you wanted. And then you realize, mm, I don't really want that. Yes. Right. You know, and so for me, this becomes about, you know, as human beings, we're meaning makers. And that becomes what meaning do we give it, you know? And in those situations, what I found was, you know, I may not really want what I thought I wanted once I got there. Yet what I've learned and realized is in that journey, I've learned things and had experiences that I can then apply to the next leg of the journey. And <clears throat> it's funny, we were, we were just, uh, I just finished doing eight days with Tony. We did a uh, day with Destiny Virtual. And one of the things that was described by one of the speakers is, you know, it's one thing to be on the journey of life. And then it's another thing to be on a voyage, you know, and a voyage is something that takes us different steps along the way to a destination, right? So that, that's a smaller part of maybe the journey of life. We have many voyages in that journey, which I thought was an interesting distinction. And I really liked the, uh, you know, the visual that that created because, in our journey from birth to death, which is, you know, let's face it, folks, we're all going to die at some point. It's part of life. And I always say the cosmic joke is when, where, and how. Um, but along that journey between those two points of our life and our existence in this body, in this world, this, this time, we have many different voyages. Every experience that we have in life is a, is a next step for our, our spiritual growth. Yeah, absolutely. You know, personal and spiritual growth, I think when we combine them, we look into, you know, what real growth is, because we can have personal growth and not spiritual growth, and we can have spiritual growth and not personal growth, you know, um, and then how does that show up? And, you know, part of what I mean by that is, you know, we could be growing personally, making all these changes in our body and things that we're learning and knowledge and education, yet we might not necessarily be growing uh, in a spiritual way. We might be closed off to spirit. And within our existence, I believe we have three elements of our existence, and that's mind, body, and spirit. And our body is the bridge between our mind and our spirit and this physical plane, right? So, you know, without our body, we're not going to experience life like we are, right? We can be spirit, yet it's, it's a very different thing because spirit doesn't have a body unless we're inhabited in one in this incarnation. And, and I find that always to be a very interesting um, concept. And some people don't like that, you know, <laughs> they can't wrap their head around the fact that we're, you know, we're human having a, we're spirit having a human experience versus human having a human experience and you know it's that learning and evolution 
that I think becomes part of, you know, the journey with, again, many voyages in between. And, you know, when I tell my story about 2007, that was a, a, definitely a voyage that changed the course of, of my destiny, my future, my journey, um, because I interacted with the world and with people completely different because I had this understanding and this experience that we are all one you know as different as we are you know from our culture to you know maybe our gender to our age whatever that is we're all the same we all have the same you know we go through a range of emotions we have ups and downs we have goods and bads we all you know ultimately we all desire and want love we want to be loved we want to be accepted we want to be part of something that is bigger and beyond us and feel that we are part of that because you know and and i think everybody if we're going to be honest with each other what what's one of the things we fear most and i can speak for myself and that's rejection right you know if it's that you know that gal you might have a crush on or you know guy out there for for you ladies or whatever it might be depending on your your <clears throat> gender identification and things it's okay but we all fear rejection because we want to be accepted by that person right you know it's the affection of our parents it's the love and acceptance of our family our siblings whether it comes down to, you know, school and work and classmates, whatever it might be, we all want that acceptance. We all fear rejection more than anything because we fear, you know, that if that, that we're not good enough, rich enough, tall enough, good looking enough, whatever it is, fill that blank in. And if we're not good enough, then we won't be loved. Right. And when we come back to source and realize that we are love, and that our love is really dependent on our ability to express our self-love, love of self first, because we have to love ourselves first, because if we don't, how do we give it out to anyone else? Yet, you know, and this is something that we talk about in uh, the six human needs psychology, uh, the fourth human need is a need for love and connection. And, and that's our primary foundation of what we all want. Yet most people in today's world, we settle for connection more than we do love because we've learned that love hurts. We didn't get our love from our mother or father or grandparents or whoever that was or that boy or that girl or that man or that woman, whatever. And so now we have that broken heart, you know, and metaphors are so powerful because, you know, we make representations in our mind and our body. All of a sudden we have a broken heart and that's painful. And it describes that feeling that we have in, in our chest when, when that happens yet our heart's not really broken we just didn't get what we desired most which is love and acceptance right and you know at some point we have to kind of get used to that in a way and recognize what that is and to me that becomes you know like a practice you know it doesn't mean that we don't acknowledge what we feel we have to acknowledge what we feel but then if we are living and if we are being present to the moment and living in the present moment, then what we realize is none of it really matters or exists because if we're just being present where we are, we're just being. If we get into our head about, you know, our lack or what we don't want, what we, you know, all these fears, now we're in our head, we're not in our heart, right? And when you're in your head, you typically can't be present in the same sense because you're either living in the past or you're living in the future. You know, worry is simply not being present, not being in the present moment because we are, you know, worried or we're considering the possibility of things not working out or going wrong or whatever that is, creating the word worry. And then we create this feeling in our body. And it's interesting, Swapna, we were talking about uh, language and vocabulary. And I'll never forget, there was, uh, it was an episode of 60 Minutes, I believe, with Ed Bradley. And he was a reporter. And he was speaking with a tribe in Burma called the Mokans, I believe. And they were a nomadic tribe. They didn't acquire things. They traveled very light because they traveled and followed the food. And Ed Bradley had asked the chief of this tribe, he says, well, don't you ever worry that you won't find any food? And <clears throat> this leader says, goes, worry, what, 
what do you mean by that? What, what is that word? And so Ed Bradley basically described it to him. And he said, oh, no, no, <clears throat> we don't have that word in our vocabulary. We don't use a word, anything like that. We either find the food or we perish. Our people don't live on. So it's not a possibility that we won't because we are, our life is committed to that we will. You know, and, and it's interesting to see that the words that we use habitually will create our reality. That's beautiful. And I was really curious to ask this question too. So as you said, the words you use, the words that you speak, they change the world around you. So how Absolutely. do we channel the power of speech for the good? Well, that comes down to consciousness and being conscious and if we take spirituality out of consciousness right for a moment consciousness is really an awareness you know are we aware of the electricity that's running through this light bulb in my ceiling right now to give us light that something's actually happening of the blood that's running through my earlobe that we take for granted that we never think about you know where we put our focus and where we put our energy is where um, is, is really kind of, you know, the things we don't take really, um, I guess the words I'm looking for is the things we take for granted and we don't pay attention to. And when we start paying attention and focusing on these things, you know, our life changes. So let's be aware of the words that we use, right? There's three things. There's our, how we use our body. Our biochemistry is huge. What we are paying attention to, where our attention is going, what I'm focusing on. You know, again, it's, am I focusing on the electricity? No, I'm focusing on this camera in front of, in front of me right here as I'm speaking. I'm not thinking about the ear and, in, in, you know, I'm not aware of that at the time. So in our awareness, when it, especially when it comes down to our language, is super, super powerful. And, you know, there's a great book out there uh, they call The Greatest Story Ever Told, and it starts with, in the beginning, it was the word, right? And that's in the Bible, right? And even if we take a look at, you know, the word abracadabra being magic, right? Abracadabra means... I create what I speak, you know? So when we change the words we use, when we change the meaning that we give it, we change our reality. And words can be super, super powerful. It's, you know, the order that we use our language and the sequencing, how, you know, it's like baking a cake, you know, the dog bit Johnny, Johnny bit the dog, same words, different order, completely different meaning, especially if you're the dog, right? So it, it's, you know, when we start using words of I can't, won't, don't, you know, these are all words that literally attract into us what we want. And then when we emote things and we put this, you know, like worry, have you ever worried about something and it happened? Right. That's a law of attraction and action because you put so much focus on it, so much energy into exactly what you don't want that we create it. And if we have a habit of you know, putting that energy, that emotion, that feeling into what we do want, we can create that too. It is that simple. Yet I believe this is where conditioning comes in. And I talked about Pavlov's dogs in the beginning when I talked about the things I was fascinated about in school. <clears throat> and we get conditioned. For those of you who don't know Pavlov and his dogs, I think it was in the 1930s or somewhere in the early 1900s. <clears throat> but the scientists had discovered that when he was feeding his dogs, they would salivate when he would start, <clears throat> excuse me, bringing them food. And then he started thinking and he decided to feed them and ring a bell, feed them and ring a bell, feed them and ring a bell. So every time he would feed them, they'd salivate and get excited for food like dogs do and he'd ring a bell. 
So anytime something's happening in a peak emotional state and there's the same stimulus, so in this case, the ringing of the bell, the dogs are excited for getting their food because dogs are, my dog's a food centric hound, right? He hears a crinkle of a bag, he runs because he thinks it's food. And it's the same thing um, that Pavlov discovered so that every time he rang the bell, he would ring the bell and then wait before he would feed the dogs. As soon as he would ring the bell, the dogs would respond for the food because they got conditioned to expect that when this happens, this is gonna happen. And as human beings, we do the same thing. And we condition ourselves habitually with the language from our parents, the school, society, culture, religion, whatever that might be, we get conditioned. And we adopt these beliefs and value systems and rules that we're not even, we don't even consciously choose. We have no awareness to choose what we believe, why we believe it, and how we're going to, you know, make certain feelings happen. We just get conditioned that way. So when it comes down to language, we condition ourselves with the same habitual language. If you take a group of people and you ask them, what kind of emotions do you ex feel? How many positive and negative emotions do you feel every week? And statistically, when this is done time and time again with people from you know hundreds of countries, they'll usually come up with about a dozen emotions that they feel regularly. Half of, half of them are positive, half of them are negative. And what's interesting is when you do this time and time again with large groups of people to see this pattern happening that, you know, it's, it's amazing because we have over 2,500 plus words in the English language that can define feelings, emotions, and how we feel, yet we habitually use the same ones. And so we condition ourselves so that every time we use that word, we feel a certain way. You know, have, have you ever said something to someone where you've meant no harm or you're just having a conversation and they literally react, right? Because you've used a word that triggers them to that emotional response, like the ringing of the bell, to when that might have happened or something of that nature. So we have <clears throat> neurological representations with words and meaning. And that conditioning becomes a pattern because everything in life, my friends, is a pattern. Our language is a pattern. How we move our body is a pattern. What we eat is a pattern. What we think is a pattern. And it becomes habitual. And as human beings, we, yes, believe it or not, it's true. We have the ability to consciously choose our words, our feelings, our emotions, and our actions. Yet... My hallucination is that most people on this planet are reacting from an unconscious place. Thank you so much uh, for yeah. sharing the importance of the power of the words. Well, if I may, it, it's super important because it's when we recognize this, you know, we can't change what we don't acknowledge, which is again, awareness, right? If we're not aware that we're overweight, how are we ever gonna change our, our health and nutrition? If we're not aware that we have really terrible language patterns, how do we ever change it? And for me, it's recognizing it. And, and at what point do we recognize <clears throat> that we're still doing it? And one of the words I do my best to eliminate from my vocabulary is the word try, right? Now the word try really is kind of a, a weak word that does not elicit any kind of maximum result potential. You know, we could say, well, hey, Swapna, I tried. I tried to do this interview, but, you know, I tried. It wasn't very good. I tried. And the reality is, is I did it. I didn't try it. I did it. I may not have gotten the results that I wanted. You know, it's like if I want to sell something or I want to promote something. I want to sell 10 a week, let's say. I do what I do, whether it's online or a retail establishment or phone calls, whatever it is, you know, so did I, 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 my goal is to sell 10 a week. Now I only sold seven. Did I try or did I, I did. I, yes, I wanted to sell 10 and I took action. I did something. 
And in that, I got a result of seven instead of 10. So now I changed my approach. Okay, what worked? What didn't? What can I do better? What can I do the next week? The next week I might get to nine because I changed some things. Because we always keep this part of the great success formula is keep changing your approach until you get what you want. Right. And so many people give up. And that's why the word try because, oh, well, I tried. I tried. I only got seven. So I tried. I gave up. Right. So we've in our culture, we've allowed the word try to um, kind of become an excuse for not achieving what we ultimately wanted because I tried, you know, or I made a mistake or I failed. So again, we look at the, this language. Well, I love making mistakes because they're great learning opportunities. You know, failure, NASA says failure is not an option, right? The only time we truly make a mistake or fail at anything is if we don't learn from it. Beautiful, beautiful perspective, Mark. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, well, it, it's, it's like this. It's like we want what we want for whatever reason why we want. And the ultimate thing, guys and gals, every single thing you want, stuff, doesn't matter, car, house, stuff, things. We all want it for one reason and one reason only. And that's because of the way we believe that that thing will make us feel. Because everything we do is for feeling. Because we want to feel good. We want to move towards pleasure and we want to move away from the things that are hurtful, that don't feel good, that are painful. So we're hardwired to avoid pain and to gain pleasure. Yet most people don't know ultimately what they want. What do you really want? Right? Yet we know what we don't want. So we'll move away from all the stuff we don't want, but we're not ever consciously moving towards what we really, really, really want because most of us don't know. Beautiful, Mark. Thank you. What do you think is the key to transformation for any person? The key to transformation is ourselves, is our own mind, body, and spirit. And it's about being open and looking for ways to grow because it's when things are growing and evolving that we're actually really living. When something stops growing in nature, it really starts what? Dying. Right. So it to me, it's important to always be moving forward and become curious, have fun, be playful, because there's a lot of great nuggets of wisdom and insight from nature and life that if we become curious, we get different answers. You know, instead of, you know, if we say, why does this always keep happening to me? Well, your brain is going to answer that question. So this comes back to language, Swapna. You know, the way the <clears throat> ask a quality question, you get a quality answer. And your brain, your mind is designed to find the answers to the questions that is asked of it. And if we say, why does that always happen to me? <clears throat> why am I always so fat? Why am I? Your brain is going to answer those questions, right? You know, you can ask yourself a question is, what do I have to do differently to get the result that I want versus why does this always happen to me? Your brain's going to come up with a completely different set of answers, right? <clears throat> you know, if we say, why am I so, you know, fat and out of shape and my body's all fallen to shit, you know, people are going to say, well, you know, you're going to get all the answers, right? And we know why that is. What if we ask ourselves a question, what do I have to do so I can live a vibrant, healthy lifestyle with energy and vivacity and playfulness so that I can enjoy an, the ultimately best life I can. You're, you're going to come up with a completely different answer, right? So it's, again, it's that conscious awareness, being aware of the words we use, the order that we're using them so that we can ask great quality questions, which will lead to a great answer. So words we use and the order we use them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, um, what's that? James Allen, As a Man Thinketh, is a great book, always referred to by some of the great teachers. 
and it's like our, our words have the power to heal. They have the power to kill. You know, I declare war. I declare peace. I love you. I hate you, you know, and what we speak is all vibration. So that vibration comes out and, you know, then elicits creation, you know, you know, I speak that of which I create, or I create that of what I speak, abracadabra, right? That's why the magicians and all the sorcerers of the day, you know, they, they were, you know, a spell, you know, spelling, right? You know, you cast the spell, it has to do with words and vibrational energy or whatever that might be. Um, our mantras, our prayers, our incantations, things that we repeat to ourselves habitually. You know, you talk to people who are depressed all the time, and you listen to their language and their story, it's always geared around why they're depressed. They're not focused on what's good about their life. You know, they're not focused on, you know, what can they do? They're, they're using that language. Imagine if we didn't have the word depressed in our vocabulary. What word would people use for the, how they feel? And then it becomes that pattern, then it gets conditioned, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's a powerful yet simple tool that can change your life. Change your story, change the meaning of what happened. You will change your life. Simple. Not always easy. However, it can be. Because think about this, something happens, that happening. I always use, here in Vancouver, we have an old antique wooden roller coaster in our amusement park. It's the same three and a half minutes every time. I use this example regularly. You know, I love the roller coaster. You hate the roller coaster, right? That happening, that three and a half minutes is the same every single time. And it has been for 80 years. It hasn't changed. That's the happening, that three and a half minute ride. Now the meaning I give the happening changes everything because if I'm looking forward to it, excited and you know ready to go, what am I gonna be doing? I'm on the roller coaster, whoa, yeah, hollering. I'm getting adrenaline, I'm feeling good, I'm smiling, I'm getting all of that great stuff that you get from being excited about such a thrill ride. Now, Swapna, you're sitting beside me. You're freaked out. Actually, you may not have even got on the roller coaster, yet you're still freaking out for me while I'm riding it because you're afraid, right? So the meaning that we give that happening creates a feeling, not just emotionally, but also biochemically in our body because thoughts are things. And you're afraid, so you're getting all the stress, all the negative biochemical reactions in your body, all based on what you're thinking. Does that make sense? Yes. Right? That's wonderful, Mark. So being continuously aware and using the words in right order and asking your mind the right questions create an experience for anyone. And, and that, that I can guarantee, because I've seen it time and time and time again, that you change the way you look at things. I think that's a Gandhi quote. Um, the things you look at change, right? You, know, you see that picture of those two guys standing there, and they're looking at the images on the ground, and one's a six. He's looking at it, it's a six. The other guy's on the other side, 180 degrees, goes, no, it's a nine. No, it's a six. No, it's a nine. Well, they're both right. It's perception, Right? Because it depends on how they're looking at it. And when you change the way you look at things, everything changes. You give it a different meaning and you rewrite that story. You take a traumatic experience in the past and ask yourself, well, what was good about that? And people say nothing. Nothing was good about that car accident or, you know, abuse or rape or whatever it is. And it's, bonafide truth. It's not to take away people's experience, yet it's the meaning that we give it. What can we learn from it? Yes, that wasn't great. This was but a moment in time of my life. Now, if I move ahead 30 years and I'm still telling that story of what happened 30 years ago, as if I'm there, I'm reliving it again and again and again and again. And that's what people often do, you know, relationships, divorce, whatever that might be. And they carry that into the future with them. 
And if we're present, that doesn't exist. We're not there. And if we're thinking about that, we're not present because in our present moment, that's not happening. And if we're worried about it happening again in the future, well, again, that comes down to worry, what we talked about earlier, we're anticipating the possibility of something happen that may never happen. And we're not being present. So when it comes back down to the meaning that we give it, some of the questions I learned uh, to ask about situations when they're not necessarily, uh, the happening is in our favor or the meaning we give the happening being in our favor is what can I learn from this? What can be good about this? What can I do to make sure this never happens again? Cause I didn't like that. You know, what's the best thing I can do to make the best of this situation right now? You know, you'll come from your situation, from whatever the happening is in a very different perspective versus, um, you know, coming in with a victim mentality or an, oh, woe is me, or, oh my God, this happened to me. We can make that, we can make our own meaning and human beings are, are fascinating because we are meaning makers. It's what we do. We look to make meaning in everything. And what if we looked at everything as having absolutely no meaning? Nothing has any meaning except for the meaning I give it, right? So choose your meaning wisely, right? And, and how do you do that? Well, what do you want? You know, we've navigated the globe for, you know, since the beginning of time through astronomy and using the stars or as a true north. People, what's your true north? What's the purpose of your life? Are you responding based on who you feel you are, what you believe in, what you hope to achieve or from your mission? Or are you reacting based on all sorts of stimulus outside of you that you have no control over? Because that's the other side of the coin. There's things we can control. There's things that we can't, right? It's that simple. And <laughs> there's, I don't even know where it comes from, but I always love quotes and quips and things because I think they're small nuggets that we can really work to learn from. And, you know, it's, it comes down, I lost my, my train of thought there, but the, it comes down to when we give it the meaning and what we can control is the wisdom. I can't control that. I cannot control that. I can, I can control the meaning I give it and then that's wisdom. Hang on a second. I can control influence and change that. That's wisdom. But if you're out to change something you have absolutely no control over, we're, we get stuck, right? And some people are always trying to change things they cannot control. And then we have a choice. And this is something I learned as well that I, I love. We either accept it, we change it, or we leave. When something happens, you accept it. Or you don't, right? You can do your best to change it, to make it what it is you want to actually have happen or whatever the outcome is. And if you can change it, great, awesome. And if you can't accept it and you can't change it, it's time to leave and move on to something else, right? And it's having that wisdom to know the difference. That's really what it comes down to. And it comes down to conscious awareness. You know, how many people even really know what the purpose of their life is, let alone remain true to what that is. So when they're having an interaction with someone, they're not getting what they want. Are they reacting and getting all mad and angry and everything else? Or are they looking at their language to change their language, change their focus to make sure that they're certain that's what they want? You know, there's, there's a, Sometimes it's a fine line and sometimes it's obvious. Yet we have to become consciously aware of that so that we can make the best decision for, for us and those that we affect. Wonderful insights. Thank you so much. So any situation, any challenging situation that you face, you either accept it or change it, try to change it or leave it. So not try to change it. So you either accept it, change it or leave it. Absolutely. And, and I have situations in my life where that comes up where it's like, okay, <clears throat> hey, here's the situation. It's not exactly what I wanted. Ah, I get angry. I react in the moment. And it's like, ah, I come back to being present. And it's like, well, what's great about this situation? I'm really grateful that this has happened, that I've got the opportunity to do this. Now, what is it I want to do? Okay, well, let's see if I can change it to make it the way that I want. 
And some things you can change, move around. Maybe it gets closer, maybe it doesn't. You've done something. And at some point, you know, if it doesn't work, you just leave, you move on to something else. And one of the great ones I, I love is to always turn like, you know, frustration or disappointment and anything of that nature into appreciation. What can I appreciate about this situation right now? And then your brain goes, nothing, you idiot. This is terrible. This sucks. It's brutal. There's nothing you can appreciate about this right now. Aha. That's your brain taking over that little monkey mind, right? And then you say, ask yourself, if there was something I could appreciate about this moment right now, what would it be? Right? Hey, Mark, I know you don't think so. And I know you right now you don't, but if there was, just and play with me for a minute. If there was something you could appreciate about it, what would that be? And you'd be surprised at how quickly you or someone you might be working with, if you're coaching or, or helping someone, they'll start looking for answers because that's what the brain is wired to do. Well, you know, and then they'll, they'll find something that could be good about it. And so it's just, it's again, conditioning because, you know, we're ringing that bell. The more we ring the bell, the more the dog salivates. So when we have something good going on, we want to condition that in more and more too, right? So that we get rid of the old and replace it with the new. And we have to condition it and just keep it going and keep it going because that's when patterns, you know, they say 21 days to make or break a habit and, you know, whatever school of thought you want to come from, you know, you're still creating that habit. You're still doing, you have to do, keep doing it over and over and over and over until it just becomes what we would call um, unconscious competence. Beautiful, Mark. What, according to you, is the right kind of mindset one needs to have to progress in spiritual as well as uh, physical life? Ah, uh, well, you bring in something I spoke about a while back and the three different mindsets. I'm glad you reminded me because I had to dig out my notes. Um, there's a fixed mindset, a growth mindset, and a benefit mindset. And, you know, when we talk about mindset, it's really about where does your mind live? Are, are you, do you live in a world that's completely fixed and these are the rules and that's just it? And that's how you operate based on a set of structure and rules. And it's just very, very fixed, right? That's a mindset. You can have a growth mindset, which really is about seeking growth and development. And, and how do we, you know, take a look at, at life? What can I learn from this? What's the growing? Because again, you know, if you're not growing, you're dying. And happiness really comes from making progress moving forward. And when we're growing, that's a big part of it. You know, and, and one, I want to give you one caveat change is automatic folks the world is changing and there's nothing we can do about it right growth on the other hand is not automatic we choose to grow or we choose to stay fixed so you know change is happening are we going to grow with it or are we just going to accept it so that's part of the growth mindset and then you have a benefit mindset what's the benefit how can i learn and grow and how can i do what i'm doing to benefit other people you know i like to think i have myself a growth and, and benefit mindset because i'm always like to grow and learn and how can i take what i'm learning and you know in my own personal growth and development and share it with others to help them have an even better life for themselves as well which i think is really important and, you know, we talk about purpose. The one thing I learned and created for myself as I did my own work was when I discovered the purpose of my life is really to be an inspiration to others and live a life of growth and contribution and have fun in the process. Because if you're not having fun, nah, you know, I, I like to laugh a lot, but, but that's the big part. So if I can inspire one person with this conversation here, right, then I'm living my mission just one person. And, and I see Swapna, I see you here taking notes and everything else. I feel I'm living that right here as I'm sharing what I'm sharing, right? You know, in terms of growth, I'm always learning and growing because I'll go back. What can I learn from this for myself and contribution? You know, I'm not getting paid to do this. I'm doing this because I love it. I'm contributing beyond myself so that if there's something I've learned and, you know, all my years of the work I do, 
there's something I can share to others and contribute, then I'm living my purpose, right? So that's kind of how I look at mindset is not to be being rigid. And, you know, there's another great quote out there is, you know, our life is in direct relationship. The quality of our life is in direct relationship to the amount of uncertainty that we can comfortably live with, right? So when things are going crazy, are you okay with that? Or are you like fixed? Because if you get a fixed mindset, you're not going to be able to live with a whole lot of, you know, chaos around you. You're not going to be able to, you know, live with anything outside of what you think is in your control because you're fixed. That's just the way it is. Whereas if you have a growth mindset, things can start happening, right? But we're growing. What can I learn from this? What else can this mean? What can be good about this? How can I share this with others? You know, you're learning and growing from it. And then the benefit, well, again, how can I share it with others? How can I, you know, learn from this so that maybe others don't have to make the same mistake I made? You know, there, there's a number of different ways, but it's about taking a look and acknowledging and recognizing that in every single moment of every single day, your past life and moving forward, even more importantly, moving forward, we can create change and transformation in a heartbeat, instantaneously. We have the ability to make a choice that will change the trajectory of our life at any given moment of any given day. You change the meaning behind something that happened to you in your past, you'll change your future, right? Because change your words, change your story, change your life. It's that simple. And feel it. When you talk about what I can learn and how does that make me feel, feel it in your body and celebrate and use your body. Because if we just get into our head and make things intellectual, the, 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 the change doesn't necessarily last as long. It can, yet it's not full because it's not integrated into your body and your spirit. That's wonderful, Mark. You shared great information. And it really helps us to check in what kind of mindset we are right now. And also on how to move towards growth and benefit mindset if you are in a fixed mindset. Great information. Because I think, you know, you have to know where you're at if you're going to make a change. It's like a map. Remember those maps of the day, you know, before we had Google Maps and everything, you'd pull out that great big page, and, you know. All of a sudden, I'm in Vancouver. And if I want to, where are you, Swapna? Where are you geographically right now? Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. So if I'm in Vancouver, I want to hop my car and I want to drive to Austin, Texas, right? And I want to come and visit you. And I've got my map. If I don't know where I'm at, how am I ever going to get to Austin, Texas? Right? You know, I'm not starting from Seattle. I'm not starting from Calgary or Prince George or L.A., I'm in Vancouver, but if I don't know I'm in Vancouver, I can never map an accurate course. Would you agree? Yes. Right. And the interesting thing is, even when you know where you're at, there are hundreds of different ways I can get to come and see you down in Texas. You know, there's not necessarily one tried and true path to getting what you want or achieving that or, or that next leg of your voyage, you know. Yet, what I do want to say is, you know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And that being said, if you ever, this is just a, a little nugget for how to, you know, kind of achieve what you want even faster. And that is a, a simple tool that we call modeling. Take someone who has done what you want to do. And pretty much, I don't think there's anything that hasn't been done by anybody else in the world today, but study what they did. And when you do that, you can learn from their mistakes so you don't have to make them again. And you can implement what worked for them even faster. So you can literally take a 10-year journey and compress that into a year, a few months, even a week, depending on the nature of what you're doing. Because success leaves clues, right? Every time we do something, if I take and study, how did he get that? Take a look at what he did. I might learn some things. How did she do that? Oh, hmm. I, if I do that, right? Because they've got a path that's already led them the way. And you can save a lot of time and money by learning from other people's mistakes. 
Beautiful, Mark. Thank you so much for summarizing it for us. Mm -hmm. Can you share uh, more about Conscious Living Radio? Well, Conscious Living Radio is uh, um, my partner, Andrew Resmer, started it about almost 13 years ago now. And it's just a, a weekly program. He's just passionate about, um, you know, personal growth, development, consciousness. He had had his own experiences. And because he was, you know, like myself, you know, we're seminar junkies and like to go to workshops and do a bunch of work. He had a platform that because he had done some other stuff with the community radio station here in Vancouver, that he started another program called Conscious Living Radio, where he brought in, you know, authors and local um, experts and thought leaders and, and things in for and interview them so that we can continue to learn and share with our community. And I stepped in a few years ago and kind of took it over. <clears throat> Xander's got all sorts of other projects and I stepped in and am now producing the show and have been for the past few years now. Great, great, Mark. Great going. Thank you, Mark, for joining us today and giving us great insights into various topics like transformation, power of words, the right mindset. I have so many takeaways from today's uh, episode, Mark. It's my pleasure. And <clears throat> excuse me. I just want people to know that, you know, the, the world is changing. We're entering into the age of Aquarius here in a few days. And we have the ability to really influence our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings, and create our reality. And Sometimes for many of us, you know, take some conscious choice and it's some people say, oh, you're just full of malarkey. And the reality is I know because I've seen it, I've seen these tools and, and this kind of mindset work. And I've watched people completely change and transform their lives just by using something as simple as words and language and changing our story. Because whatever you perceive, whatever you believe, whatever you see, you can achieve it. You just have to believe in yourself and you have to implement some of the strategies that work. And we have the ability to change the way we feel, the way we think and what's going on in a moment's notice. We can go from totally ecstatic to being totally calm and peaceful. And that to me is the test of when we come into the present moment and we live in being present, our pain from the past, if we're being present, doesn't exist right here, right now, unless we focus on it, tell the language and the story in our head, and we will feel it. We will get that emotion. We'll get that emotional state by, again, what we pay attention to, our language, meaning, and story, right? It's that simple. And when we change that, we change our lives. And not just ours, but the lives of the people around us. Because I don't know, have you ever changed something in your life? And people go, something's different about you. What's changed? They can't quite put a finger on it. And you might've just gotten a, diff a whole different one, one distinction from one workshop or a book it changes everything. And you start compounding that, like compound interest. One small change over the course of time you know, it is, is miraculous what you can see over time, but we have to stick with it. Great, amazing. Thank you, Mark. My pleasure. That was a very insightful session with so many takeaways. My key takeaways, be mindful, have fun, and be curious to make any transformation. The words we use, the meaning we give to any situation will change our reality. So we need to choose the meaning we give wisely. If we come across any challenging situation, either accept it, change it, or leave it. Choose to respond rather than react and also check what was good about it. Break the habits and old patterns once in a while to learn something new. And change your words, change your story, and change your life. Thank you all for joining us today. We have more speakers coming in our next episode, so stay tuned. For upcoming events and programs, please visit www.psstmglobal.org. Subscribe to PMC Global on YouTube. Thank you.